tonight on CBC Vancouver News. And today is a good day for drivers and riders across Metro Vancouver and especially in Surrey. A judge orders Surrey to stop ticketing Uber drivers also. We're just staying where we are. That's all we're doing. They're surrounding us, trying to intimidate us. Mounties move in to dismantle a fortified checkpoint in Wet'suwet'en territory and... We just said we don't think that this is a good idea. We don't want to go. Coronavirus fears have BC cruise ship passengers trying to change their travel plans. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Surrey Mayor Doug McCallum's ticketing tirade against Uber drivers is over tonight. A judge has ordered his city to stop issuing tickets to the recently launched ride-hailing company. McCallum has been fighting hard to keep Uber out of Surrey. The CBC's John Hernandez now on what the mayor plans to do next and how the taxi industry is reacting. Ride-sharing is still a sore spot at this Surrey taxi lineup. We only uh, demand that there should be uh, level playing fields, otherwise we will uh, uh, be out of business. The city's mayor, a long-standing ally for these drivers, but today, a crushing defeat in the battle to keep ride-sharing companies off Surrey streets. A Supreme Court judge ordered the city to stop ticketing Uber drivers working within its borders. I couldn't believe that our city would do that. Was I surprised at the court's decision today? Absolutely not. They made the right decision. We need to be representing all of the residents, not special interest groups. We need to let the market prevail. Bylaw officers started issuing fines to drivers for operating without a city business license late last month. But the onslaught only lasted a matter of days. Mayor Doug McCallum's response to the court's decision was also swift. Time to move on, he said in a statement, declining further comment. Cab drivers like Menga Sarai appreciate his effort, but admit they're disappointed. It's going to hurt everybody. It's going to hurt us. I mean, there's only a certain amount of people we carry every day. We'll see. We'll have to wait and see. I'm standing outside Surrey City Hall right now, and we know that Uber drivers have been reluctant to pick passengers up in this area, mainly because they're afraid of being ambushed by bylaw officers. But now that this conflict is seemingly resolved, I'm going to see if I can get a driver to come pick me up. It takes about 10 minutes, but this driver arrives undeterred. Uber officials are eager to get more cars on the road. Surrey is an incredibly important part of the region. You know, with over half a million residents, a large number of dr drivers who use Uber reside in Surrey. Uh, it's going to be a very important part of our business, and we're really looking forward to working with Mayor McCallum. For now, city staff say they'll be working with the mayor's council to develop a regional business license, one that would ensure a level playing field between ride sharing and taxis. John Hernandez, CBC News, Surrey. And right on the heels of the Supreme Court's decision, the Passenger Transportation Board revealed its decisions on a number of new ride-hailing applications across the province. The board approved two new companies. The first, Apt Rides, which will operate in the Lower Mainland and Whistler, and also Cabu Ride, the first company to receive province-wide approval. The board also refused the applications of three other companies. New coronavirus numbers out of China tonight. The country now reporting 86 new deaths since just yesterday, and the number of cases jumping to more than 31,000. The outbreak remains centered in Hubei province, and that is where the World Health Organization says there is a shortage of medical supplies needed to fight the outbreak, equipment like masks and respirators. And what is available is up to 20 times more expensive than usual, because there are too many people buying protective equipment who don't need it. WHO discourages stockpiling of PPE in countries and areas where transmission is low. We call, all, we call countries and companies to work with WHO to ensure fair and rational use of supplies and the rebalancing of the market. Meanwhile, China's efforts to contain the virus are ramping up tonight. Several cities are banning large gatherings for events such as birthdays, and there are limits 
in some cities to how many family members can leave the house at any given time. Elevators in high-rise buildings in Hubei province have reportedly been shut off, and there are reports of officials going door-to-door -door checking people's temperatures. Well, sail through several coronavirus-affected countries, or say Bon Voyage, to $10,000. That's the choice being faced tonight by a B.C. couple who booked a cruise last year through Southeast Asia. They're supposed to leave in less than two weeks. As Deb Goble learned, the cruise operator has told them refunds and rebookings are out of the question. We stand to lose about $10,000. When Mike Mitchell and his wife booked their vacation, it was supposed to be a two-month adventure. Now he's worried they'll be sailing on what he calls a human petri dish. So we plan a cruise that would start in Singapore in February. Kicking it off with a cruise made perfect sense back in November. The plan was to start the trip by flying to Singapore, catching a Norwegian cruise ship and spending three weeks traveling to different ports, ending in Dubai. But as cases of the coronavirus started coming to light, a Mitchell started questioning whether they should go. And after late, this latest uh, quarantining of a couple or three ships now, it's just not something that we really want to do. Don't want to be stuck on a ship. The only way they could contact Norwegian Cruise Lines seemed to be online. They have sent three emails and got nothing back other than a form letter saying the company has no plans to cancel the cruise. But it would be screening all passengers boarding at different ports. We don't want our money back. Just give us a credit and we would like to go on the ship um, when it's safe to do so and enjoyable. Traveling with 3,500 people all getting on and off the ship at 10 different ports just isn't something they're willing to do. So uh, we, we are kind of stuck in this situation where we have to go or we're forced to go or we lose our money. The Mitchells have travel insurance, but it won't cover their cancellation request unless the Canadian government changes its travel advisory level to avoid all travel. We understand what they're, what they're up to. You know, it's just, it's just, it's a company, they have to make money and things like that. But in, in this time of the world when it, this thing is happening, it's not a good idea. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Vancouver. And we will have more for you on coronavirus later this hour, including the latest on those Canadians sick on a quarantine cruise ship off Japan and the WHO warnings of a worldwide shortage of equipment that protects against the virus. Our protesters filled the steps of the legislature in Victoria this morning. You cannot continue to criminalize us simply because we are an inconvenience to your resource sector. Hundreds gathered to protest RCMP police raids at an anti-pipeline camp in Wet'suwet'en Territory in northern B.C. Six people were arrested there today at the camp during a pre-dawn enforcement of a court injunction order. But that wasn't the only protest today. Indigenous land is under attack! What do we do? Stand up! Fight back! Pipeline opponents rallied on the streets of Vancouver as well this afternoon. Dozens of protesters walking down Clark Drive towards the Port of Vancouver entrance, where they ultimately blocked access to three different locations of the port, all chanting their support for those at the Wet'suwet'en Territory. Taking us to the heart of the conflict zone is the CBC's Greg Rasmussen, who is near Houston and brings us the latest. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Good. My name is Jason Charney. Good far enough. This dramatic confrontation unfolded on a logging road on the disputed land. Do you understand that if you do not leave, you will be arrested? I thought you took cultural classes to understand. So, okay. Right now, you're breaching the injunction. Right now, we're having okay. a misunderstanding then. Police left, but tensions rose as people wondered what would happen next. Up this road is where police have been arresting people. This afternoon, though, those opposed to the pipeline blocked it with about a dozen vehicles. That means police remain on the other side. There is nothing you can say to make us stand down. Media aren't being allowed in, but this scene was filmed by those who call themselves land defenders. The only thing that I fear is that the world will continue to let this happen. Yesterday, six people were arrested at the first of three camps set up by the Wet'suwet'en along the road. Now released, this woman says she locked herself in this pickup truck until police smashed the window. I went down here, they grabbed my legs, they pulled me out, 
They had me down on the snow, handcuffed on my stomach. So I had four officers holding my arms and I grabbed my arms and I held them up with the strength of our ancestors. Elected leaders from 21st Nations along the route have signed agreements, but the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs insist they have rights over the area. A BC court ruled in December they must not obstruct the pipeline. I think the humanity within the RCMP, the province of British Columbia and Canada itself is gone. I think the democracy of Canada is being threatened because they're being listened, they're listening to a corporation. Coastal GasLink says it worked hard for a negotiated settlement, but the company says work needs to resume to meet construction deadlines. Is anyone here willing to speak with me? Late this afternoon, police made another attempt to exit. Have a good day. But were met by a wall of silence. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Houston, B.C. To the TMX pipeline story now, where the federal government is now on the hook for dramatically higher costs. Bashi Capellos, the host of Power and Politics here on CBC, shows how both mega projects are causing big headaches. The cost to build the Trans Mountain Pipeline didn't just go up a bit today, it went up a lot. The expansion project is uh, quite different than it was a few years ago. Construction of TMX will now cost Canadian taxpayers $12.6 billion, nearly twice the original estimate due to delays and accommodating Indigenous and environmental concerns. It never had to be this way. It's ridiculous. Not a single tax dollar should have been spent on the Trans Mountain expansion. A federal government that is attempting to be a climate leader should not be splurging all of this money, taxpayers' money, on this pipeline. But while the feds aren't thrilled to swallow the cost, they're not downplaying it either. Government sources hope coughing up cash convinces Alberta Ottawa is taking concerns about national unity seriously. So we stepped in because we knew that we needed to, to have the backs of those Albertan workers. But Alberta's premier appears to have a new litmus test for the federal government's commitment to the province. This is exactly why we need approval of the tech frontier mine. Cabinet has until the end of the month to decide on the $20 billion tech frontier mine in northern Alberta. It's passed all regulatory hurdles, but the political ones will be tougher. Liberals are openly voicing their opposition to the project. We look at the carbon emissions that would be coming from it. It just it doesn't seem to fit with transitioning to a low carbon economy and meeting net zero by 2050. The tech mine decision will make paying for TMX look relatively easy. If the Liberals decide to approve the mine, they risk alienating so many people who voted for them and for stronger action on climate change. They also risk alienating members of their own caucus itself. On the other hand, if they don't approve the mine, they risk creating a national unity crisis of sorts. At the end of the day, a great political cost, no matter what. Bashi Capellos, CBC News, Ottawa. Now the NDP government is out trying to sell its plan to completely overhaul ICBC, with promises the new system will mean cheaper insurance premiums for you. The biggest change revealed by Premier Horgan and Attorney General David Eby yesterday, cutting lawyers completely out of the picture. The goal is to redirect hundreds of millions normally spent in legal costs to people. Under the new plan, anyone injured in a car crash, regardless of fault, would be entitled to at least $7.5 million in care and treatment benefits. There will also be increased wage loss coverage, as well as new benefits for students and caregivers. Government insists that is, this is not a no-fault program, stressing insurance for at-fault drivers would still increase. David Eby stopped by the CBC Newsroom this afternoon to answer some of your biggest questions. How can you be absolutely certain that this plan is in fact going to save drivers money on their insurance premiums? Well, uh, there's a couple reasons for that. One is the model that we're moving forward with is already in place in two different provinces. In Manitoba and Saskatchewan, they have public insurers and exactly this model of insurance. So we know that they offer better rates, uh, the best rates in Canada. We know that they offer better benefits, the best benefits in Canada, uh, and they've been doing it for years. Uh, most of them have applied uh, for zero rate 0% rate increases for at least the last five years. The other reason is um, we are removing a significant piece in the system, which is uh, insurance that people buy in case they get sued by someone else. It doesn't exist in the new system, and that's called third-party extended liability. You buy it as something called optional insurance. It's very expensive. That product doesn't exist anymore because you don't need it anymore because there are not lawsuits in the system. 
Okay, a uh, question from Michelle Nicole, who's asking how will the removal of lawyers affect drivers' ability to safeguard against false claims against them or safeguard against undervalued payments or appeals? Good question. So there's actually three layers of safeguard uh, in place. There's a, a process, a new office, uh, the Fairness Office for ICBC, independent of the Claims Office, that'll be taking concerns from people that they're not being treated fairly by ICBC. They're being told they're responsible for an accident and they weren't. Uh, they're not getting a benefit they're entitled to and so on. That's one piece. The second is, if that doesn't work out, there's the Civil Resolution Tribunal, which uh, will function like a court. It's independent of ICBC and the government. It's a tribunal. Uh, they're set up for people to represent themselves, but you can still bring a lawyer. Uh, and you say, I'm entitled to this benefit, and ICBC's not giving it to me, and they have the power to order ICBC to provide that benefit. There will be specifically a law that says ICBC has a duty to advise people about the benefits they're entitled to and to give those benefits over, so that's what people would use. And then they can also appeal uh, through judicial review to the Supreme Court uh, a decision from that tribunal. And the third is the ombudsperson, who's an independent officer of the legislature uh, who will be overseeing the system and advising British Columbians if there's unfairness happening. Okay, here's a question from... Uh Jean LeBlanc, uh, who will determine if someone has a mild versus severe injury, such as a brain injury? Good question. Will their family doctor be uh, responsible for seeking specialist assessment, such as neuropsychological uh, assessments, that kind of stuff? Yes, so the, um, we are very reliant on doctors uh, to be a significant part of the system and we're glad to have the support of Doctors of BC for the care part of the system uh, because uh, it's your family doctor if you have one uh, who will be saying, look, uh, this person is able to do this, but they're not able to return to work, they're not able to lift heavy objects, they're not able to do housekeeping, uh, and then ICBC will provide benefits based on that uh, feedback. ICBC will not make those determinations about what your injuries are, your doctor will and if they need you to see a specialist, uh, then that will be part of your treatment plan with your family doctor. If you don't have a family doctor, it's more complicated. So we're engaged with doctors at BC, with the disability community, uh, and uh, we've issued a white paper uh, outlining some of the ways that we hope to go forward uh, because it may be that someone inside ICBC would be appropriate or maybe people don't feel comfortable with that, finding some other way to have those assessments done. And if you want to see more of that interview, be sure to check it out online at cbc.ca slash bc or on our Facebook page. Well, a sad update to a story we brought you last night right here. 97-year-old Mary Wong, who was featured in our story about a diamond theft, has died. Wong was living at the Arbutus Long-Term Care Center. She had to give up almost all of her possessions when she moved in three months ago. But she held on to one of her most cherished belongings, a diamond engagement ring her husband bought her in 1943. The centerpiece of the ring was discovered missing, and it's believed it was stolen from her as she slept. Her daughter says Wong passed away overnight and added she will continue pursuing an investigation into her mom's missing diamond. Well, the weekend is here. Brett is here. Can we finally say goodbye to this rain? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I've been waiting for so long to actually say that we are going to have a nice looking weekend. And I was digging into it the last time we had a rain free weekend in its entirety was November 2nd and 3rd. This is a long time. We certainly still have some weather here to be going through right now. See the spiraling action on satellite and radar here? This is a really powerful storm. May not seem like it, but it is coming through across the south coast. Not only is this bringing rain, but I want to show you just over toward Abbotsford, we had a few lightning strikes just a very short while ago. This turned into a little bit of a squall line, giving some even heavier downpours than the regular old-fashioned rain that we were seeing much of today. Right now, we are still dealing with some special weather statements across the south coast. This is for wind gusts. We're seeing some wind gusts right now from the southwest as we go through the next few hours and into tomorrow morning. These are going to sharply turn to the northwest and it's possible that we could be seeing gusts here upwards of 70 kilometers an hour. And with snow is not done yet across British Columbia. Any travel that you may be considering doing between Hope and Merritt, the Coquihalla is looking a little bit dicey. 20 to 25 centimeters of snow could be accumulating through tomorrow morning and same thing goes along Highway 3. 
similar story there. Now, in terms of our weekend forecast, here already is the good news that I like to share, and I say good because I enjoy a good sunny weekend. Who doesn't? Looking at sunny conditions for both Saturday and Sunday, and especially Sunday right now, this is looking like the best day that we could potentially see. So lots of stuff to look forward to this weekend. First time you've been able to say that in a long time. You got it. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. You're welcome. And a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC GEM. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. While cruise ships remain quarantined, some companies are cracking down on who can come aboard, who's welcome and who isn't, right after the break. And thanks for joining us online on our live stream tonight, where we are ad-free during the television commercial break. All right, your online exclusive content this evening. The tech sector is a pillar of BC's economy, and it's not just here. Regions right across the country boost talent that big-name companies want to recruit. Google, just the latest heavyweight to announce a hiring spree. It plans to triple its Canadian workforce. But as Peter Armstrong explains tonight, that is having a trickle-down effect in other areas of the industry. These are heady days for Canada's tech industry. Every week, it seems, another company expands and grows. This week, it's Google's turn. We are announcing that we are building three new offices in uh, Toronto, Montreal, and Waterloo. Woo! <laughs> Super excited. Google's chief financial officer says this is about tapping into Canada's booming tech sector. And that's going to give us the capacity to grow to 5,000 people by 2022. And it really reflects the extraordinary momentum that we're seeing in Canada. Announcements like this are a shot in the arm of an industry that's quietly become the fastest growing tech region in North America. But for years now, CBC News has chronicled a nearly breathless search for talent about 25 employees to about 50 or 52. By the end of the year, we hope to hire another 10 to 15 people. Every time a tech giant lands here, local companies feel ever more squeezed. It's very competitive and it's getting more competitive for talent. Ian Klugman runs an organization that's helped build up the tech community in Canada. He says the struggle now that it's booming is making sure local startups don't get overshadowed. We don't want to become a branch plant economy, but we also understand the need for diversity in an ecosystem, diversity in an economy. Um, small, small companies are, are key because they will grow. Google says there's room for everyone, and part of today's announcement is a new incubator aimed at helping local startups secure funding. We do best when the broad ecosystem works well. But any ecosystem can be fragile, something to watch for when an already big player suddenly triples in size. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. All right, uh, more to come in just a couple of seconds. We're going to head over to uh, Japan and that coronavirus outbreak on the Diamond Princess cruise ship, the latest on that, and more coronavirus coverage coming right up. Stay with us. To Japan now and the coronavirus outbreak on the Diamond Princess cruise ship. In the space of just 24 hours, confirmed cases on the ship have tripled. Out of the 251 Canadians who were on board, there are now seven infected with coronavirus. Chris Brown rather, has the latest on this outbreak on the ship that's moored just off Yokohama. The Diamond Princess now has the dubious distinction of being the most concentrated outbreak of the coronavirus anywhere in the world. It's scary. And passengers such as Canadian Trudy Clement wonder how long those like her who aren't sick will be able to avoid getting the virus. We'd all like to get home. If we're going to get this disease, we'd like to be home to have it 
isolation or not, but not here. It's, it's not a good situation. Ironically, it seems the only way to get off the ship before the quarantine end date of February 19th is to actually contract the coronavirus and receive treatment. No matter how happy Princess Cruises tries to keep everyone on board, there's no escaping. It's a disastrous scenario for the entire cruise industry, with ships in Japan and Hong Kong dealing with quarantines and passengers being pulled off ships elsewhere as a precaution. Shortly after four people were taken off a vessel in New Jersey, Royal Caribbean and Norwegian cruise lines announced anyone with passports from China, Macau or Hong Kong is now banned from getting on board. Well, of course, this is an extraordinary step by Royal Caribbean. Uh, the, the, we've never seen something like this before. Business prof Marvin Ryder says it's clearly not fair to label 1.4 billion people who are Chinese as possible carriers, but the tourism industry is panicking. In the Asia market, not the China market, the Asia market is down 80%, 80 percent, 80 percent. Again, not surprising given everything else you're hearing, but the big question is how fast will that bounce back? That report from the CBC's Chris Brown in Hong Kong tonight. Well, with so much attention focused on coronavirus, many doctors warn we're forgetting about the flu and just how dangerous it can be. Influenza pandemics throughout history have wiped out millions of people. But as Vicadopia reports, new research suggests when you were born, may influence whether or not you get sick. You ready? Alta Eng only rarely gets flu shots. She's never been sick with the flu before. I always thought that I have a pretty good immune system, uh, but I've seen how the flu has affected the neighborhood and my friends and family this season, so I decided to get one today. Eng's luck could have something to do with the year she was born. New numbers released today show how some age groups are more susceptible to getting sick than others. Sometimes it's the young, sometimes seniors. Certain group of people that they might be more susceptible uh, during specific years if one type of virus is, is circulating. This demographer worked with infectious disease experts to track down the effect of what's called antigenic imprinting, the idea that your exposure to different flu strains builds antibodies that make you resistant to future infections. Using flu data, their study found that Canadians born during the deadly Hong Kong pandemic that started in the late 60s and are now between 40 and 50 were more resistant to the flu strains of the past two seasons. As you will get other infections, later in life, even if it's with different virus, um, you will most likely uh, boost your first antibody, the first antibodies that you met er earlier in life. Knowing which age group will be vulnerable to the flu could be important for planning during epidemics. Our hospitals in Canada are typically above 100% capacity, so there's no, there's no wiggle room there, or at least not a lot of wiggle room. This infectious disease specialist yeah. says these new flu findings are important, but there are multiple factors that influence who's most at risk during outbreaks. Their vaccination rate, uh, the population, how sort of immune is that population, the relative humidity in the room is actually a big player in terms of influenza transmission. Mm -hmm. And so all of that stuff is, is playing into the epidemiology, which is why it's so hard for us to predict what's going on. As for Alta Eng, she's not taking any more chances. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. Well, with so much attention on China right now, we wanted to talk with that country's top official here in Vancouver. We spoke with Chinese Consul General Tong Xiaoling today about transparency around the coronavirus emergency. Canada-China relations, Meng Wanzhou, and the two Canadians detained in China. Here's a portion of her interview with the early editions, Stephen Quinn. We've seen the doctor who identified the virus and, and raised the alarm now actually die as a result of contracting coronavirus. The Chinese state is now tightening social media. Just how transparent is your government being? It is very unfortunate. Dr. Li Mingliang, uh, Li Mingliang passed away mm -hmm. because he was also infected. Was he not apprehended by police in Wuhan for spreading rumors? I think he had a conversation. He had a meeting with the, with the local uh, authorities in, in, in Wuhan. But he also, he, he's also one of the 
medical workers and the fighters on mm-hmm. the front line. Mm. Transparency is everywhere in China. On mainland, between the government and other international organizations. Uh, you acknowledge that the, you know, the relationship between China and Canada now is n- not on the best terms. Why do you think that is? I think it is known to everyone. We are not to blame you know, to bring down the relationship. It is the Canadian side, the Canadian government. It is their mistake. So the Canadian side has to correct its mistake you know, by releasing Madame Meng Wanzhou. You talk about China being a country of uh, the rule of law. Canadians would say we are the same. We have an extradition treaty with the United States mm-hmm. uh, that was honored with the arrest and detention of Ms. Meng Wanzhou. So um, this is just e- excuse, you know, from the Canadian side or from or from other country concerned mm-hmm. in this case that it is just a pure legal case. It, actually, it is not. You know, we have been saying this many, many times. This is a political case because the Americans, they target particular Chinese high-tech company mm-hmm. in order to exercise their hegemonism, you know, their mon- monopoly on, on the advanced technologies. So the arrest and detention of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor for more than a year now, uh, is that also political? It is not. It is not. And it is not in relationship with this case of Madame Meng Wanzhou. It is you, separate. Do, do, they are in no way connected? The, the arrest of Mr. Spavor no, and Mr. Kovrig are, are not retaliation? It is for the, not connected. These two Canadian nationals, uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, are suspects in endangering national security of China. Their cases have been brought into the procedure. Uh, I mean, the legal and judicial procedures in in China in mm-hmm. accordance with the law. So I will not, you know, further, you know, go down the details or elaboration. I think my my idea is quite clear here. My mm-hmm. my point is clear here. There's no relationship between the case of Madame Meng Wanzhou and the cases of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. Well, every Thursday, us students are meeting to keep an ancestral language alive. After the break, we'll take a look at a class where 40 people are learning Cree.
A quick check of some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I look forward to spending a lot more time focused on customers as opposed to the courts. A judge orders the city of Surrey to stop ticketing Uber drivers. The mayor says he's now ready to move on. We have four land defenders. Four land defenders against this. Look what they bring against us. Mounties have moved in to a dismantle and arrest people at a fortified checkpoint in Wet'suwet'en territory in BC's north. Several people, in fact, have been arrested. We just said we don't think that this is a good idea. We don't want to go. Coronavirus fears have some BC cruise ship passengers trying to change their future travel plans. While we live on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil homeland, according to Stan, uh, Stats Canada, the most commonly spoken Indigenous language here is actually Cree, a language from the prairies. Every Thursday night, more than 40 students with Cree ancestry pack into a classroom at the Native Education Centre. Our Urban Nations unit went to Cree class to speak to the students and the teachers. I really believe that language is a, a huge part of reclaiming our identity. I myself grew up in the foster care system um, and really disconnected from culture and identity for a long time. And so it was really important to connect in this urban environment um, to our language and to our identity and culture. We started asking around for a Cree language, if there was any Cree language groups happening at that time, and there wasn't. But there was a large cohort of people that were really interested, Cree people here in Vancouver and Surrey that were interested in learning um, the language. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Uh, really happy to help uh, the many students and many people who want to learn the language including my grand great granddaughter here she mm -hmm. comes to, with me every thursday to, to learn try to learn the language i think it's so beautiful because uh, uh, it's so beautiful to know that people can speak the language can learn to speak the language and when I go back home in Alberta, a lot of them speak the language in my hometown in Slave Lake area. When I go there and visit, uh, it's so beautiful for me to hear everybody speak. When I come home, I'm so lonesome for it because nobody's speaking it here. So now when I'm teaching it and we're speaking, it makes me feel that much more better. It was important to me because I grew up learning English and I've heard my grandma speak Cree with her friends and I saw how happy she was and how different the dynamics were. Um, and I just really wanted to learn that and to be able to express myself in that way as well. It means I love you, kiss me now. <laughs> let's, let's go for a ride to Vancouver. And I learned to, um, to exist being um, white passing, right? And, and to have some of that shame. Um, associated with it. So reconnecting culturally is a big part of my healing and language has become so important within that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what is Eha? And so to see her and witness her um, without shame and with pride. Um, <laughs> so much pride and so much strength. Um, in who she is as a Cree and a Dene woman, young woman, and she shares that with her peers. I've, I've never witnessed shame in her, and that is, is healing. minutes before 7 o'clock on this Friday night, a live look uh, south up Camby Street this evening. Well, a windstorm is coming ashore. Brett is going to break down details of that next, and he's going to talk about a mysterious bright round thing up in the sky that's heading our way. That's next.
The weather update is brought to you by The Body Shop that always takes you back to your happy place. BC's favorite, Craftsman Collision, Air Miles, and Bigger Smiles. I get to uh, Brett with the local forecast in just mm -hmm. a second. I want to mention, though, that a, a powerful snowstorm has hammered much of southern Quebec, forcing school closures and flight cancellations. Yeah, some areas are facing wind gusts up to 60 kilometers an hour, and they're expecting between 30 and 50 centimeters of snow by the end of the day. In Montreal and elsewhere, authorities are urging drivers to postpone non-essential travel, Roads are slippery, and as you can expect, the visibility is pretty bad. Yeah. Not a good situation there. Not a good situation. Fun fact for you today, mm. almost every single school on the island of Montreal, be it high school, CEGEP, elementary mm -hmm. school, was all cancelled, with the exception of McGill University and Concordia. And I went to McGill, oh. and there have only been two snow days that they've ever issued oh. in the past 21 years. Sort of at the base of the yeah. hill, if I can Yeah, that, exactly. Right? Yeah. So they are, they are some hardy folk over wow. there. People actually skied and snowshoot well, into class today. Yeah. But we have none of that none here. Of Instead, it's going to be the exact opposite. I'm so happy to be able to talk about a nice, sunny weekend. It's going to be great. But let's reminisce one more time, shall we, mm -hmm. about all of the rain and sort of cloudy conditions that we have seen. We are now officially at 29 consecutive days of rain or snow. For those of you wishing for a round number, we might get it because early Early, early on Saturday morning, we may see a few more drops fall, and that will make it a nice, perfect 30 days. Wouldn't that be fun? In terms of our winds, this was something that I was mentioning a little bit earlier. This might catch a few people off guard. We're going to be seeing a significant shift in these winds initially from the southwest, changing to the northwest. So early tomorrow morning, especially for places out towards, say, UBC or even Stevenson, we're going to be dealing with some gusts that could potentially reach 70 kilometers an hour. But inland, very different story. It's going to be a lot calmer and certainly going to be a lot sunnier at the same time. Our precipitation forecast, this will be the last time you see one of these maps for a little while, simply for the fact that we're dealing with rain over the next few hours, continuing essentially until Saturday at about 6 or 7 in the morning. So if you want to sleep in tomorrow, you are likely going to be missing all of the rain. It may be a little bit cloudy, but as the day goes on, it's going to be becoming a much nicer, clearer day. In terms of why this is the case, we have a nice area of high pressure that's going to be making its way onshore. This is going to be keeping all of BC, no matter where you are essentially dry for Saturday and especially for Sunday and that's going to be sticking around even into next week for the work week. Now if you're interested in maybe going outside and celebrating with some of these nice conditions, if you're going into the backcountry, do be mindful that no matter really where you are across the, the province, the avalanche danger rating is still considerable. So it's not nearly as high as it has been, but definitely something to be keeping in mind. But take a look at this five-day forecast. I cannot tell you the last time that I put something like this together. We are not only looking at sun for two days in a row, but really every single day from now until Wednesday is looking like we might get a little bit of that sunshine and temperatures right at the seasonal mark. So pretty good, would you say? I would say. <laughs> pretty good indeed. Thanks, Brett. You're welcome. Well, around town you might have noticed the variety of grocery store options, but what's behind the success of Asian supermarkets? Our Shop Talk series is next.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On March 1st, join Mike Colleen at the Step Up Challenge. Climb the MNP Tower and help raise funds to improve detection, treatment, and survivorship of prostate cancer. And celebrate International Women's Week with Anita Bath at West Coast Leafs Equality Breakfast on March 6th. Get ready to be inspired at this one-of-a-kind event. For more, check us out online, cbc.ca slash bc. When Flight 752 was shot down in Iran, killing everyone on board, one of the focal points for those grieving in Vancouver became Amir Bakery in North Vancouver. Mourners gathered in front, lighting candles and praying. Owner Amir Pasavan lost both his daughter, Fatima Pasavan, and his wife, Aisha Portugadere, in that crash. Here's a look back at their life. They were really kind. They trying. They were trying to help people. They, they were kind. They were kind to us when we came here. They gave my mom a work to here, and they helped me a lot to work here. Yeah. They helped me with, I don't know, with many things. She's very lovely, she's very kind, and she's very hard worker. They were so busy with job. You know, as you see, their business, and they work in full time. Canadians are craving more variety from their grocery stores. They expect to find more ethnic foods on grocery store shelves when they go shopping. In our latest Shop Talk series, which looks at the changing way we buy food, reporter Tina Lovegreen explores the success behind Asian supermarkets. It's been three months since Sun Given Foods opened its doors, but already it has its sights set on expanding. And this year plan, like uh, we want to add in like a six to eight more in the lower mainland. Sun Given has over a hundred stores in China, and the owners, who have roots in Vancouver, decided to bring the concept here, taking over a space once occupied by Safeway, which shut its doors here and nine other locations across Metro Vancouver. Our philosophy is a more natural, more less additive, and less processed. Inside the store, everything is in English and Chinese. In-house products are abundant. There are no sales or promotions, but free samples are a daily offering. Some given foods uh, may have a formula that's going to work. I mean, they're they're promoting healthy food. They're doing it in fairly small stores in terms of they're not, you know, 100,000 square foot gigantic boxes. And they also seem to be catering to, at least initially, in urban markets. Retail insider's Craig Patterson says Canadian taste buds are changing and consumers crave variety. I think it's more the international foods. I mean, the prices in these stores are usually not, you know, exorbitant. Uh, they may be comparable to what we find in, more, in a more mainstream grocery store, but I think it's the uniqueness of the selection. It's, it's something different. Uh, um, you know, the, maybe the, I don't want to, you know, stereotype that the steak and potatoes type of diet, you know, isn't as attractive to a lot of people, including myself, uh, perhaps than it, than it once was. From Korean American supermarket H Mart to TNT, international grocers are drawing a crowd. Seafood City, a California based Filipino grocery chain, now has stores in Ontario and Manitoba. Food has always been a bridge to experience other cultures, and in a multicultural city like Vancouver, analysts say the secret ingredient to success for mainstream stores is to stock up on international foods. In order to be relevant to them, they have to carry some assortment of internationally inspired foods. So what that tells me is that if you're a grocer, this definitely needs to be part of your considerations. To meet the growing appetite for foods from around the world. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up, a local dog is set to take a big bite out of the Big Apple. Why Bella 
is New York bound after the break. Okay, have a look at this. Uh, those are bats flying through the sky, often dropping spiders and mites on people down below. Hundreds of thousands of them have overtaken the small Australian town of Ingham. The problem has gotten so bad, the town council is taking up the cause, but they're having problems getting rid of them since fruit bats are a protected species. So for the better part of the next three weeks, loud sounds and high-intensity lights are being used in the downtown area to try to get them to go away. Unfortunately for residents, that's supposed to start at dawn, which at this time of year is about 4.30 in the morning and is planned to last for an hour or two each day. Well, that is certainly a way to start your day. Exactly, to deal with their back problem. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> well, a Chilliwack dog is heading to the Big Apple for one of the grandest dog shows in the world. Mm -hmm. Bella, the German Shepherd, has qualified for the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show at Madison Square Garden. As our John Hernandez reports, her seven-year-old owner will be cheering her on from the sidelines. Good girl, Bella. Bella likes to be the center of attention, and most of the time, the German Shepherd has earned it. Just ask her owner and best friend, seven-year-old Parker Dewan. She loves to play tug-of-war. She knows a lot of tricks. She's a really good show dog, and she, she's a really good dog. Step, step. These two have been side-by-side side ever since the family bought Bella from a local breeder. They knew the dog was special right away. She's perfectly happy to be someone's house dog, to, to lay on the couch or lay on the bed and, and just be content. Um, you know, she loves being with my seven-year-old daughter. Um, she really adores kids and uh, she has the ability also to go in the ring and, and, you know, and really turn it on. Behind her bright eyes, a competitive drive. Bella is the top-ranked German Shepherd in Canada. 
She's won national dog shows here and in the United States. Guiding her through it, her handler, Courtney Penner. She's a little wild, but you want that kind of character for the dog show world. Bella is now set to compete in one of the biggest dog shows in the world, the Westminster event in New York City. She's the only dog from the Lower Mainland that qualified. It's exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting to think that, you know, we're going to be competing in a venue with the best of the best, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, to know that we have a dog that has that caliber, um, you know, she's, she's a great one. She'll go nose to nose against 2,600 other dogs from across the world. And she's eager to get back in the ring. I just had her at a show last weekend. Nice. She wasn't showing, but she came along on the trip with us and we walked by and she was barking, trying to get back into the ring and she'll be excited to get in there and do it again. She was pretty jealous going to this last show, not being in the ring with everybody else. This German Shepherd punches her ticket to the Super Bowl of dog shows next week. But for her number one fan, she's already a winner. She works really hard to get ribbons. John Hernandez, CBC News, Chilliwack. That's a good looking dog. Yeah, beautiful animal there. Wondering though, I mean, she must be well traveled at this point mm -hmm. in terms of making the way all the way over to New York City, but I wonder if that's stressful for the dog. Do you think it is? Yeah, maybe a little bit, mm. but uh, used to it, I would think. Yeah, but, probably. Uh, yeah, best of luck to Bella. Absolutely. And the family, uh, Monday and Tuesday. Monday, perfect. The dog show in, uh, in New York City. That's it for us tonight. Uh, Dan is here at 11 o'clock right after the National. Have a fantastic sunny weekend. You got it. Remember the sunscreen, people. <laughs> sunscreen. <laughs>